Alan Chen, who is the CEO of TasteWise, um, who is, uh, which is a really interesting artificial intelligence company out of Tel Aviv, uh, helping us to understand what we can do with food in the future. Alan? Ah, yeah, there we are. Yeah, cool. Good to see you, Alan. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, of course, we're having you here. So tell me, what are you doing? You know, at the moment I'm speaking to you, but in generally speaking, um, TasteWise is a food intelligence platform. Uh, we're helping the world's largest brands, um, companies like PepsiCo, Nestle, Kellogg's, Campbell's. We're helping, we're helping them basically to measure and predict uh, what people uh, cook, eat and order. So using artificial intelligence, uh, we're providing them the data and insights in real time. Okay, cool. So, so how are people cooking, eating, and ordering today? The, and how the, will they do it in the future? Sorry. Yeah. So, 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 what would you think? So, so, do how do people cook, eat, and order today, as opposed to what they will do in the future? You know, the the, the good news is we can tell you the answer. The bad news that it may change tomorrow morning. So the idea around uh, TasteWise is actually the ability to get a pulse on the market, market as soon as it happens. And we saw how important and critical this becomes in times of uh, change like COVID-19. The survey that you looked at that you conducted uh, six months ago or even a month ago is irrelevant for what consumers want today. Um, functional food, for instance, the need you know, to eat or consume foods uh, in order to uh, maybe improve your immune system ahead of COVID-19 or maybe to lose weight. Um, before uh, last year, when we were checking the stats, we saw the one out of three conversations online actually reflect a functional need. But when you move to COVID-19, we find that one out of two in less than a year, one out of two conversations or uh, instances where people are actually consuming food or beverage is related to a need, to a functional need. And this is staggering. And if you're not on top of it, it's very unlikely that you will be able to uh, create or market products that consumers will, uh, will be uh, enjoying having. This is what you said. So people, people's tastes and their uh, preference are shifting all the time. And, and you are there, of course, to help people understand how they're shifting so they can adapt to, to what people do. So, so, so tell me a bit more, uh, Alan, what is it that taste why? actually is doing you know we know we know what the outcome might be but how are you doing this yes yeah, so, so actually i prepared a few slides that will show you what are the biggest uh, in, um, elements that actually impact the the behavior so i'm having to have the, this conversation but I'll, i'm also happy to show you stuff that is actually touching to the hearts and minds of consumers that is often overlooked by the the, the industry for instance asmr um, we tend to speak to a lot of executives and they don't know what it is. And it's actually the audio, the, the, the sound that foods are, is, are making when they're being consumed, the chewing, the crackling. And the thing about ASMR is that it's not a marginal thing. You're talking about hundreds of millions of videos. Some of them have hundreds of millions of viewers. So if you're talking to the average consumer, today in the US, it's very unlikely that they haven't seen an ASMR video or enjoy the sensation of it. Speaking okay. of- anyway, ASMR, what does that stand for? Oh, it's, it's, the abbreviation is almost impossible to actually uh, um, you know, follow. It's audible, sensational uh, response. So basically what kind of uh, um, uh, sense is actually being intrigued by hearing the sounds of food? By the way, in many cases, the research shows that when people have a crispy sound or a crackling sound for what they eat, they think that the food is tastier than if they don't have it. Tastier, not necessarily. So there's a huge impact in, in the, you know, we're used to seeing that in advertisement, maybe for a soda can, when you open it and you, you hear the noises, you know, of the, of the uh, CO2, uh, um, you know, releasing, being released. But this is actually going to uh, almost everything. The other thing is mukbang. If you don't know what mukbang is, you have zero chances to market anything to anyone who's, who's under 25 today. So mukbang is actually the, the phenomena of, in which people are actually, or, or the youth are actually taking uh, um, 
a large volume of foods like 20 burgers and they're eating it all at once it's also a big part of the phenomena called cheat day because people are always on diet and they need a way out they need a one day a week that they actually eat whatever they want so cheat day and mukbang usually go hand in hand and it's not going to be complete without talking about platforms like TikTok, right? Where consumers are constantly being, you know, uh, uh, intrigued and actually stimulated around the foods that, that they're eating. And what you see here, actually, it's not TikTok that everyone knows. It's actually Twitch. Are you familiar with Twitch? Uh, no, I can't say I'm familiar with Twitch. I, I'm right. a YouTube guy, so you know, I'm not familiar with anything. So Twitch today um, is one of the largest uh, social networks in the world. We're talking about more than 300 million registered users. We're talking about 7 million people that stream in live a lot of things that they do throughout the day. It started in the streaming, live streaming uh, video gaming, and it moved into live streaming your cooking, your going out to restaurants, your experience ordering food online. And we're talking about, uh, again, hundreds of millions of, of uh, views for a lot of these streamers that actually impact what people are eating and why are they making their decisions. And it, again, um, cannot be overlooked without the fact that 20% of all of Instagram is all about food. So if you want to follow you know, what is actually the future, you really have to see what is the present and being able to uh, digest large volumes of information like you see on on uh, on Instagram is nearly impossible unless uh, unless uh, you're very dedicated uh, to the cause and the answers are in the social networks it can be confused and uh, and the most important thing from the the analysis of conversations is actually not to see what people eat it's not so it, it doesn't matter a lot if someone had uh, uh, a vegan cheeseburger. What you need to understand, what we need to understand in order to improve our ability to actually bring new market, uh, new products to the market is to understand why. So if I see a, a, a person eating a cheeseburger and they write, I love this uh, vegan cheeseburger, hashtag cruelty free, that means that they're eating this burger because it did not impact animal uh, rights and this is what you need to understand and and this is actually quite uh, quite important and before I move on to a few tidbits about what actually people eat um, it's also important to to understand that a lot of the uh, innovation and the new behaviors in the food industry if we want to predict the future are coming from what's happening to people when they're walking into their kitchens opening up the pantries or the fridge you remember this you know you go to the fridge, you open it, you look, you hope something changed, nothing changes, you close. And then you go online and you try to, you know, maybe uh, search for a recipe, dinner for kids, uh, antioxidant or maybe uh, anti-inflammatory uh, um, uh, juice. And, and you need to be able to know what are people searching for and where are they landing, which recipes they're using to solve different issues that they have today. And, and uh, there are millions of recipes and, and uh, obviously the need to analyze it. So um, the last thing that you need to do in order to find out what is actually the future of your product on the shelf or the retail experience is actually to see what our restaurateur is all over the world doing. If you are able to follow the menu items that are going on and off the menus, delivery, you know, uh, in the menu that is being served in the restaurant, you actually have a good proxy to know what is the most innovative, um, in innovative uh, concept that consumers really appreciate and like. And, um, and for that matter, uh, for instance, TasteWise is, uh, is digesting 700,000 menus every, uh, every week uh, from all the restaurants uh, in the US. Um, so I want to skip uh, the, the explanation about TasteWise. Um, and I just want to give you uh, four insights into what we're seeing that really makes a huge difference in trying to define the next product that you're going to package or the, the next product or variation or flavor that you're going to produce. So one of them is, is really veganism, right? Uh, Sweden is the, is the home for Oatly, one of my favorite brands. Um, and um, 
And it's important to, to, to know that veganism is the, is the fastest growing uh, um, diet today uh, in places like the UK. Uh, by the way, in the UK, um, around 7% of the population is, is vegan, whereas in the US it's at three and a half, so twice as much. Um, and uh, if we go into one of the, the most interesting uh, um, tidbits, we found out that Brighton is actually uh, almost twice as much vegan as London. So sometimes the obvious is not so obvious and you really need to have the information to be able to capture the trend. And uh, we see that Wales is bigger in veganism than England as a whole. So what's interesting about veganism, and I mentioned it earlier, is not to know that veganism is, ri is rising. It's not so useful to know that. What you need to know and it, what we all need to know in order to impact the food industry as a whole is to know that the biggest driver for people to move to plant-based and veganism is not about animal rights. Seven times more people care about their own health when they choose plant-based. So if we as an industry want to help more people move towards a plant-based uh, world, we, we can tell them, you know, that the product, you know, uh, made no suffer to no animal. But what we have to make sure is to campaign around healthy uh, um, meat alternative and plant-based plant uh, uh, products. And this is the insight that you need to get to. Another aspect that is, again, very, very interesting around sustainability. So when you're looking at the main driver for sustainability, so when people say, oh, I'm having a sustainable, uh, a sustainable product, a sustainable burger, again, they care more about their own health then they care about waste and recycling and environment. So it's important not to stay in the high level and say, oh, you know, I'll make my next uh, product sustainable. We also have to bring the aspect that the consumer uh, uh, cares for. Um, we mentioned COVID-19, right? COVID-19 changed everything. We see uh, more, you know, uh, more uh, increase and decrease in, in different needs uh, in matter of days sometimes, sometimes in matter of weeks. And it's important to know what people are uh, interested in. What we find is that there is a lot, there's a boost in it and an increase in um, foods and beverages that are actually functional. So stress relieving, uh, uh, sickness treatment, immune system. Uh, by the way, we saw that weight, weight loss is, is going down. It's actually not going up. So uh, it's interesting to see that people uh, find solutions that are actually immediate and can immediately release their stress and immediately immune their system. And they know that, you know, losing weight is not something that can happen immediately. So they were less interested in that aspect, even though it was reported that there is a, a correlation uh, uh, for weight and COVID-19 uh, um, uh, health. Uh, in other words, uh, one of the stress relieving uh, uh, insights we found in the UK, closer to, to home for you, uh, we found out that actually CBD is on the decline. But what is actually going up is actually L-theanine. The ingredient that is actually present in tea and the most interesting thing, and we will probably see it coming uh, onto the shelves very soon, is actually coffee with tea together. So there is actually a complementary benefits when you drink coffee uh, and all the the, the great uh, benefits of energy boosting coffee and so on with the healthy and in that takes out the the, um, the impact on the nervous system. So this is uh, scientifically proven and it's actually something that we're seeing consumer doing more and more. So the, you know, British coffee, uh, British tea is uh, meeting, uh, you know, the, the Italian coffee and making uh, big waves on the consumers. Um, last but not least, um, one of the, um, the, the, the most you know, fascinating things for us to see is how resourceful the industry is and how resourceful uh, and, and, and successful you can be when you understand the consumers, you know what they need, and you're trying to solve their problem, not necessarily with the solutions that you had so far. So kits, cocktail kits, for instance, uh, where a huge solution, uh, and I don't know what, what's the, the status in Sweden, but in Israel we have cookie kits, pizza kits, cocktail kits. You basically, instead of ordering the pizza ready-made, you order it almost made, and then you can 
you know, take the dough and, and, and uh, put the toppings you wish with your kids maybe and make it a little bit more experiential. Uh, or you can have your cocktail kit and, and, and you know, and enjoy a night, uh, maybe a, a, a romantic night in with the experience that, uh, that you have some cocktail kits even come with a music recommendation that you can put on your Spotify. So the market is actually um, showing a lot of, uh, of signaling into once you understand consumers and their needs, you can adapt your sometimes your product, but we know it takes a long, a lot longer. And sometimes you just have to work on your marketing and packaging. One, ex one last example we see with the, um, in the US, the fastest rising diet today is actually the ketogenic diet, especially amongst moms, right? Um, what we found is that it's great to know that keto is growing, but you also need to know what are people actually, what are the ingredients, what are the dishes they're eating in their ketogenic diet, right? And one thing we saw was actually a boost and an increase in sales for cream cheese. And then you say, oh, but people are trying to reduce fat, not if they're in keto. So you can actually find explanations and the reasons behind a, a lot of the trends and actually be able to see uh, what the future uh, is like. Um, so if you want that and more, uh, we have a lot of uh, free PDF reports on our website and uh, you're welcome to join that's, us. There. That's super cool. I mean, like, yeah, Alan, this is super cool. So this, you know, I can just see now how, how the, you know, the hairs are graying on the food executives out there and how this headache is pounding. And, and you know, of course, this makes for a more agile and flexible uh, you know, system in the future for companies that are, they need to be more agile and flexible. The question is, you know, can you help them reach out as well? So are you talking about the, the like the last mile, the marketing side of things? And yeah, how do we reach all these consumers? We can learn from them, but how do we reach them? And can we reach them with the same type of ease that we can learn from them? So the challenge, the challenge is always uh, to get people's attention, right? We get exposed to um, thousands of ads every day. So it's tough, uh, uh, it's tough to, uh, to get, uh, get a lot of visibility. But I tell you one example, something we're doing with uh, one of the largest food brands in the world. What they found is that there is actually a huge uh, content gap in the market. It sounds like there isn't, but um, we're with our technology where uh, we discovered 4 million different recipes all over the world and we can see how people are actually using them and how often they visit them and so on. But there is actually around 4 million more recipes lacking and needed. So there is a gap, especially when it comes to cooking with kids and parenting. So if you're a brand and you want to be out there, you can still do a lot. If you create great content that can actually help, help you solve problems when you walk into the kitchen and you're looking for um, for dinner for your kids in five minutes and your brand that gives your, you know, the voice out there, um, you will actually get their attention. Um, and we know that in the age of social media, um, when you have a bad product, people will talk about it. But when you have a good product, they will also talk about it. And Oatly is a great example for that, right? Um, for a product that celebrates consumer and, and the environment and, and health and, um, and it makes a difference. So, you have to start with a product, but then, but then there is there are many tactical solutions to actually get and reach to the to the consumers, and and there is a lot of segmentation tools today, and and Tesla does that as well, telling you, you know what, cream cheese, you've been targeting the wrong audience. Why don't you target moms that are actually trying to lose weight, and and maybe show them a keto diet or a keto recipe. So uh, I think that today is as easy. Uh, you don't have to go always through the retailer like you used to. You have to do it before. Um, if you get on people's top of mind, they will end up adding you to their baskets. This is really interesting because this, this means that we've actually transformed the food system from being something that is very industrial and very based on scale to something that's super agile and online all the time. I mean, like online, you find all the clues to what people need to have or want to have. 
um, you take that tech and you develop new products or new communications around it, or perhaps even package it together with playlists, which is, you know, of course, not a food product, right? Uh, but it adds to the food, food product. And then you market it online and probably you sell it online as well, right? So it's a close, closed loop system in a sense. Um, this is so interesting, Alan. And of course, we can, we can talk about this for hours and hours, but uh, if you would say, you know, the most surprising stuff you've seen out there. I, I, you know, you, you, ASMR, of course, feeling in, from audios, etc. But that, that was an eye-opener to me, I must say. What else is strange that you've seen out there? Strange. So, uh, to be honest, the combination of tea and coffee was, uh, was a big surprise for us. Um, there's another big trend we're seeing that I don't know if I should call it strange, but uh, we're seeing uh, the Brits, for instance, replacing their baked beans with green beans for health purposes. So even the most traditional untouched breakfast, you know, um, uh, the continent, the, you know, the, 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 the breakfast in, uh, uh, you know, with your, your, with your typical sausage and, uh, and fried tomato is actually changing today. So it's a great opportunity and, and, and also great responsibility for all of us to push the right products to consumers. And um, um, we also found, for instance, uh, you know, in the pizza segment, you know, in the US, um, out of uh, the $900 billion that the restaurant industry is, um, you know, if 25% of it is actually pizza sales. Um, and uh, that's surprising, right, on its own. Uh, but or not so surprising. But basically, what we see is the movement to uh, um, gluten-free and low-carb pizza, right? So cauliflower uh, crust pizza is, you know, becoming a. It's it's already a thing. It's already a trend. And one interesting thing we we found out earlier this week, we found actually that people are moving to oat flour and oatmeal-based pizza. And the benefit there is not only that it's uh, that is gluten free, but also that it is high on protein, even the dough itself. So it's not strange, but it's actually very exciting to see the innovation coming from uh, from even the most traditional of categories. And uh, and this is what makes it even more difficult for brands today, because if you're not going to accelerate the the time to market, and first thing to do is actually to understand the consumer you're not going to be there. And, and um, we have, uh, you know, an amazing uh, uh, opportunity here to help the big uh, brands, of course, that we're working with, but we're also working with small ones. So they have the, the, the great thing that the small and medium-sized brands that are actually responsible for the, for the uh, biggest part of the share of growth in the industry, uh, more than the big brands, are actually, uh, you know, the next Oatly, I can say, they are actually um, they have a great uh, responsibility as well, and they're very agile. So the use of technology is no strange for them. So cool, Elon Chen from Tastewise, and it's Tastewise IO if you want to go there and uh, and get you know heads up on the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Alan. And, Thank you. Uh,